Welcome to the Trad Dads Podcast, where we examine cultural and political issues through the lens of traditional thought. So today I want to talk about manufacturing and specifically the discussions that are often had about industrial policy or trade uh, policy that is intended to boost employment in certain industries, but might have some kind of trade-off in terms of the uh, reduction in output or uh, GDP effects or something like that. And so what I want to do just to frame this is that all of this is a, uh, all of these uh, discussions happen in, in the context of some kind of uh, catastrophic, you know, reduction in GDP or catastrophic reduction in income uh, per person or something like that. And, and it's, it's, it's very interesting because that's, that's such an, uh, that's such a political way of talking about it, but there's, but, but it's sort of framed as an economic argument. And so I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, that you get these people who say, well, you know, the, the reason you are in favor of some kind of industrial policy or, uh, you know, trade policy is because you don't understand economics. Um, and then uh, the, the arguments they make in favor of, um, you know, not using protectionist trade policies or not coming up with some kind of uh, industrial policy is that, oh, well, you know, this is going to, wh- what do you want to do? Do you want to, do you want to make everybody poorer because everything's going to be more expensive now? Uh, you know, and, and, and it's always just sort of discussed in these catastrophic terms. And so what I want to do is go through a little bit of data um, on uh, manufacturing employment and manufacturing output in the U.S., um, but, but again, just to, to set this up is the, the first thing you need to do when you have a discussion like this is when you hear one of these catastrophic claims about, oh, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to make people poor? Is that what you want? You, you want, you want to hurt poor people by making things really expensive? Uh, you know, obviously this is a political statement, not a, an economic statement. And the, the reason that you can identify it as such is, is because, the the person saying this is not talking in terms of marginal effects, right? They're not talking about, okay, well, at the margin, if we change, you know, this trade policy or if we, uh, you know, implement some, uh, you know, some type of industrial policy, then what will happen is that at the margin, right, the, the cost of manufacturing will go up a little bit or the... Um, you know, the competition from uh, abroad will change slightly or something like that. And so some things will have to change in terms of the business models or in terms of the work uh, that's done in the U.S. in terms of manufacturing. Maybe we will have to manufacture more stuff here. Maybe that will be done at a slightly higher cost. But again, this is all at the margin, right? This is all uh, an incremental increase in the cost or an incremental reduction in output or something like that. It is not uh, some kind of catastrophic thing, and it's it just cracks me up whenever we whenever there's any kind of change in trade policy in India industry, and of course I'm most familiar with agriculture, but you know it's uh, oh China's going to stop buying our soybeans, oh no, um, and then essentially what happens is uh, you know our soybeans just get shipped somewhere else at a slightly lower price, uh, you know, and, and I I used to stand in front of audiences and say this stuff all the time, it's stand in front of farmers and say this, you know, that, well, you know, there's some kind of beef embargo or, you know, our trade, our, uh, you know, trade dispute with some country is going to reduce the amount of beef that we export um, to them, specifically to that particular country. But it doesn't mean this stuff's just going to disappear and you're not going to get a price for it. It means that it's probably going to get exported somewhere else at a slightly lower price or, God forbid, you know, consumed domestically at a slightly lower price. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, these policies don't push certain people out of business. I'm not saying that they don't, you know, harm certain uh, businesses or uh, they, they, they might not, uh, you, you know, over time catastrophically reduce certain industries. Sure. That's, that's quite possible if you design, if you design a policy incorrectly. But um, as I've said before, uh, you know, we often are treated to sort of the the a discussion of the nirvana fallacy in terms of economics, 
which is to state that just because you can design some optimal policy on paper doesn't mean the implementation of that policy um, will get you the results that you want. And so, in other words, just because you can design a policy that gives us nirvana doesn't mean that it will actually deliver on nirvana. And, and I kind of like to flip that around and say, okay, well, that's true. But at the same time, that's not necessarily a critique of policy because the, the other side of that is just because some policy won't be perfectly implemented doesn't mean that it shouldn't be. It doesn't mean that the shortcomings of it um, you know, make it so you shouldn't use that policy. And so I think, I think it has the potential to, uh, you know, uh, provide some good caution, right? I mean, we, we should, we should caution ourselves whenever we think we've come up with some policy that's going to be a panacea or it's going to fix everything, um, that we shouldn't, uh, you know, we should, we shouldn't actually believe that because it's not, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't attempt to use policy when it can be beneficial, uh, or at least when the costs of it at the margin are much lower uh, than the benefits, especially if those benefits accrue to uh, people that really need help. Um, and so what I want to do is look at manufacturing employment. And, and one of the things that, you know, we've we're treated to oftentimes in terms of this manufacturing debate is it's, it's not trade policies that have reduced manufacturing employment. It's um, it's technological change. And I mean, that's fair enough. But, um, you know, the technological change thing is uh, a separate issue. And maybe I'll link to the uh, Andrew Yang versus um, Tucker Carlson episode that uh, I, I did a while back, talking about the concept of, uh, you know, coming up with some kind of policy that, you know, ensures that people have jobs and, and the technology doesn't uh, overtake those jobs. Um, and so what I want to look at here is is very interesting, and I'll, I'll put links to these graphs because, you know, obviously this is an audio show, so I can't really show uh, images. But what's interesting is that our biggest drops in manufacturing employment have not come uh, – it's less obvious that they've come from some kind of innovation. Um, and what's actually happened is that during recessions – they have manufacturing employment, especially the last two recessions. The last two recessions, manufacturing employment has just absolutely collapsed. And then it's just simply never recovered. Um, and so what you see is, and I'll, I'll put this first one up, um, all employees uh, manufacturing, uh, in, uh, so, um, it's a monthly data set from, from uh, the St. Louis Fed. And so sort of prior to the, uh, the, the, the recession in 2000, uh, in say July, there were 17, a little over 17 million people involved in employed in manufacturing. And at the end of that recession or at the end of the, at the end of the collapse in, uh, manufacturing employment that happened at that, during that recession, uh, I'm looking at September, 2003, there were 14 million people employed. So that was 3 million jobs that just disappeared as a result of that recession. And during the, the period after that recession, the recovery that happened in all, you know, in many other industries, there was no recovery in employment in, uh, you know, after that recession. And in fact, it basically continued to decline. And at the, on the eve of the 2008 recession, um, we saw uh, employment down under 14 million um, in say November of 2007. So then we look through the recession and at the absolute bottom in early 2010, we're at roughly 11 million employed. So in other words, at, from the beginning of the 2000s, we're at 17 million people or over 17 million people. And then at the very end of that decade, we're at just over 11 million employed. And so I mean, that's that's a catastrophic loss of jobs, especially when you consider that these are, for the most part, are going to be these types of breadwinner jobs, these types of jobs that can support a family on one income, uh, you know, maybe with a little bit of help or something like that. But for the most part, they can provide a solid household income. Uh, and now, you know, so we so we lose six million jobs over two recessions 
Uh, and so I, I just don't see this as in, as an innovation thing. I, I maybe there's an argument to be made for this, but it, it's very difficult to measure technological progress. It's extremely difficult to measure that and do any kind of sophisticated uh, econometric study on that sort of thing. Uh, innovation is, is is very difficult to measure. If you just look at the entrepreneurship literature, it's 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 very difficult to figure this out. You can't just count patents. Um, so then what happens over time since the end of 2009 is that we see this very tepid, slow recovery in jobs to an extent. Now, I want to point out that we still are not at the level that we were at the beginning of the 2008 recession. So at the end of 2007, uh, again, we were at, let's see here. The end of 2007, we were again around, you know, 17 or excuse me, 13 million jobs, something like that, 13 and a half million. Now, currently, with the most recent data I'm looking at here, which is November of 2019, so 10 years later, um, we're looking at 12.8 million employed. So yes, there's been a recovery of you know roughly a million and a half jobs over that period of time, over. Uh, excuse me, since, since 2010, since the, the, the end of that uh, recession, or excuse me, since the end of that decline, uh, the most recent decline, you know, things started to recover in 2010. But again, 11.5 million in January of 2010, and we're at 12.8. Uh, you know, that is not a recovery. That is not, we're not even back to uh, that level that we were at the, at, on the eve of the recession in 2007, much less having recovered to the, uh, the levels before the 2000 recession. And so what I think is interesting about this um, is if you look at growth rates, you know, again, you, you basically see these big drops um, over the last two recessions, and then the growth rate is essentially negative. The year-over-year growth rate is essentially negative until after 2010. And then we finally get some growth. But, again, I'll, I'll have a I'll have, um, you know, links to these uh, – to these images, but you look at uh, growth rates in employment going back into the uh, in manufacturing employment going back into the fifties um, and even the sixties. There were solid periods of growth again after recessions. Um, you know the recessions are negative by far, but there was solid growth when we weren't in a recession. And so I, I just don't, I, I'm not sure I buy this idea that it's, that it's all down to, you know, technological innovation um, or, you know, certainly it could be replacement, you know, robotic replacement, but the, that robotic replacement is not, is not an innovation necessarily. It's just an employment reduction. Um, and so if we're concerned about employment, and especially if we're concerned about employment in, uh, you know, a lot of the major manufacturing areas, uh, the Rust Belt, other parts of the Midwest. Um, I, I mean, there's a significant amount of manufacturing in my hometown, and, and I've, I can remember when there was a lot more. Uh, a lot of these places were shut down, um, and people just moved out of the area. And so th this is not a clear-cut argument from a moral standpoint, and not even really, as, I'm, as I think I'm showing here, not even really an economic argument. Because, again, the idea is that we have these catastrophic losses in these important breadwinner jobs and yet we have very little um actual growth in you know real output in the manufacturing sector and so again i'm gonna i'm gonna put these other charts up that you can see uh so manufacturing sector real output from the st louis fed uh and this is a, a little bit of a different type of series it's quarterly um, but again, you see these, you know, very, you know, these, these reductions in uh, output over um, these recession years, uh, but you see output recovering and uh, you see it recovering back to levels uh, that were comparable to before the recession. Now, it did take a lot longer than a lot of other sectors and a lot of other sectors, uh, you know, we saw recovery um, as early as 2010, 2012, where output in those sectors got back to pre-recession levels by that time. Um, but for but for manufacturing output, uh, you know, we were at 108 on this index in uh, the fourth quarter of 2007, uh, which was the peak for this index. And we are just now, uh, as of the last couple of years, getting back to 
those levels in terms of output. Um, and so, you know, it, you can see that it has been a long road in manufacturing, even just looking at from an output perspective. But again, so what we're told is that if we if we have any kind of policy that maintains these jobs, whether that's trade, whether that's um, you know restrictions on uh, uh, mechanization or, or you know using robots and stuff like this, whatever kind of or or even just some kind of industrial policy where we're talking about constant industry concentration, um, you know market power and stuff like that, if if we're we're told that if there's any kind of restriction on this stuff, then it's just absolutely going to be a catastrophe. Um, and what and what's so interesting about that is that you know we we have seen no recovery whatsoever in employment, and the sector hasn't grown that fast. So apparently. There is just not much that there's just not that much growth to be had in terms of manufacturing output, um, and so what would, what would our trajectory be in terms of output if we had allowed that employment to come back? If we had put policies in place that would have supported that employment, <clears throat> we're not on a huge growth, uh, you know, a super fast growth trajectory in in uh, output anyway. So why uh, why are we letting this uh, you know cause problems for us why are we why are we letting these communities that depend on manufacturing employment why are we letting these families again the basic unit of society why are we letting these families that depend on breadwinner type jobs um, fall apart for tepid growth uh, in the manufacturing sector you know post recession and I will say too that you know since the 2016 election we have seen some better um, output growth numbers in terms of uh, sort of year over year uh, growth uh, in, in that sector so in the third quarter of 2018 three and a half percent growth rate over the third quarter of 2017 but again this is this is in the regime of you know Trump's policies that we were told were, uh, you know, going to be catastrophic and blah blah blah. Uh, and, and again, you know, maybe this is all debt fueled. Who knows? But the point is that even even the good growth rates were are, are far less than they were back in the 1990s. In the 1990s, this uh, real output index for manufacturing was growing at you know seven and eight percent. Um, you know, it's certainly uh, north of three or four uh, quite often. And so, you know, again, this is so this is what we're preserving. We're having these these catastrophic losses in employment that are not coming back. You know, after these recessions, we have these huge drops in breadwinner jobs and they're not coming back. And all we're getting out of it is very tepid manufacturing growth. You know, sorry, it's just not a trade off I want to make. And again, thinking at the margin. OK, well, so we we go from, uh, you know, maybe three percent growth to two and a half um, you know, in, 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 again, on good years since this last recession, uh, three and a half percent to slightly less than that. And maybe we get the jobs back. Uh, I, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Uh, and I, and I could, I could see that happening. I could certainly see that happening. Um, you know, the part of the reason that this output growth is, um, is leaving or, you know, this output growth is not uh, recovering is because we are buying from overseas. And so the manufacturing is just gone. Um, But if we put in policies, put policies in place that would have maintained, you know, these, um, you know, these millions of jobs, these, uh, you know, the, the, the six, seven million jobs lost uh, over this period, then perhaps, you know, if we'd preserve that manufacturing output, we'd actually have more manufacturing output, Right. And so, yeah, of course, we don't want to get into a game of just counting GDP. But even if there is some kind of reduction in, uh, you know, the 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 output or or some kind of increase in prices for manufactured goods and stuff like that, it would probably have been worth uh, the uh, worth it to uh, maintain this employment. Uh, because again, manufacturing employment is a huge source of these breadwinner type jobs that provide enough money for a family to uh, live on with one income. And so, again, I just want to review: don't you know, don't seed the framing. I think that's the biggest thing: is don't seed the framing to people that are telling you that you know any kind of industrial policy or any kind of trade policy or any kind of restriction on you know roboticization or or quote unquote innovation, uh, is going to be this huge catastrophe. Um, you know, don't cede the frame to them. 
you know, catastrophe is de- is defined not by uh, you know increases in the prices of blenders. Uh, catastrophe is defined by losses of communities, losses of families, um, losses of uh, the ability for you know one person to provide for a family. Uh, that's the catastrophe because that has a moral component that matters a lot more than. Um, oh boy, I got a I got a cheap blender from China and it's cheaper than it was last year. Well, who cares how cheap your blender is? You know, I don't want communities in Appalachia and I don't want American communities to die. You know, these are our people. They are uh, our countrymen. They're our um, our nation, and we should care about them. Uh, and we should be willing to put in place policies that, while they might cost people a little bit in terms of standard of living. Maintaining these communities and not letting them die off is certainly worth it. Thanks for listening to the Trad Dads podcast. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes. It really helps us out. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.